we will continue our study of ecosystems in lesson 3.3. Our main focus will be on aquatic ecosystems. Aquatic ecosystems are grouped based on abiotic factors, as an ecosystem is, but we have extras here. Unlike terrestrial ecosystems, we have things such as water flow, depth, distance from the shore, salinity, and latitude. For those of you who don't know what salinity means, it's the amount of salt in a body of water. Now let's start talking about freshwater ecosystems. Freshwater ecosystems means that it does not have salt water. The major freshwater ecosystems are ponds, lakes, streams, rivers, and wetlands. Animals and plants in this ecosystem are used to not having salt in the water. As in, if I take a fish from a freshwater ecosystem and put it into a saltwater ecosystem, the fish will most likely die. And trivial facts you should know is that only about 3% of the water on Earth is freshwater, and of that 3%, 69% of it is in glaciers, 31% of it is in groundwater, and only about 0.3% is found in lakes, ponds, rivers streams, and wetlands. So, to make this clear, 69% of the 3%, so that's a very minuscule amount, but because of the amount of water overall, that makes up a massive amount. And only about 0.3% of the 3% is found in lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, and wetlands. These are a few images that may help you familiarize yourself with the terms. Now, let's go over a graph to help you better solidify the previous knowledge. As you can see, as we mentioned, we're breaking down the 3% into percentages. Rather than taking these percentages, just remember that 69%, 31%, and 0.3% to simplify things. Let's go on over to out of the five, rivers and streams. The main characteristics of both of them is that they flow. They flow from a source and they keep on moving forward. They move in one direction. And if they ever happen to stop, they're no longer considered ever in stream. But what is the difference between a river and a stream? Stream, you could say, is a much smaller version of the river. Now, we, uh, we already discussed, they flow in one direction. The source of the water is called the headwater, and the area where the water exits the river and or stream is called the mouth. Slope, as you would imagine, would determine the direction and speed of water because the only thing that's pushing the water in a river or a stream is going to be gravity. Now, you can judge the speed of it by the slope. So let's do a visual test. If you're looking at the right or the left one, which one appears steeper? Obviously, you would say the right one. Therefore, if water were to flow on the right picture, it would flow much quicker. And the faster it flows, the more sediment is going to be picked up, and that sediment will become into silt and such. Now, the sediment itself, is anything that the water, wind, or glaciers just throw around, such as soil, dead materials, all of that. Now, where does the slope level? When the slope levels, the water flow, or the speed of water, is going to decrease, and then the slower the water is, the more sediment builds up, because fast flowing water is capable of making the sediment not piled down in the bottom. It's capable of pushing the sediment forward. But the more it slows, the more sediment is going to pile up. And that's why if you see a flowing river, you're going to see it as a clear river. But if you look at a lake, for example, you're going to see a lot of the sediment piled up at the bottom. The water won't be as clear. Now, what is silt? Silt is just different soils such as mud or sand or clay even. 
Now, another form of energy is the interaction between the wind and the water, which more tear up the water surface, but this does not necessarily have to do only in rivers. This is in every aqu aquatic ecosystem. When the wind turns over the water, oxygen is dissolved into the water, and that is how fish can breathe. Now, erosion is another topic of aquatic. Is if a river, let's say there is a river here, and we have a mountain. If the river is flowing on the mountain right around here, what do you think would happen to the rock? The rock will not stay in this shape. As the water flows, the water will pick up sediment or small particles off of the rock. And slowly but surely, the water will keep on chipping away at the rock until it breaks a significant part of it where it's humanly not. And this process is called erosion. This process can very well change the flow of the water and how fast it goes. Because if we keep on eroding, then the river or stream could become larger. And as it becomes larger, it will flow slower. It can also change where it's flowing. If a segment of rock, let's say this rock right here, is weaker than this rock right here, then it's more likely for it to erode the weaker rock, and therefore our flow will change direction. And of course, since we are breaking down rocks, which are made up of small minerals and nutrients, that will add into the water, and the water will carry it as it goes forward. Now, we were talking about sediment and how it can pile up in the bottom. Let's focus on this a little bit more. Fast-moving rivers and streams don't have much sediment accumulation because the water is moving so quickly that the sediment doesn't have time to build up. But because the water is moving so quickly, fewer species with the exceptions of things like salmon and that, are able to live in the turbulent water, as it would exhaust them. Well, if in slow-moving water, so slower-moving rivers, for example, you are going to have a lot of species in the water, such as insects, perhaps, or young versions of tadpoles and such, and many fish will be able to feed on them, not to mention things like algae can go in there. Now, this is just how you'd, you'd see a slow river moving forward. Now, notice how this river right here flows, flows very slowly, and you can see mud building up below it. You can see a sediment down here. Now, if we were to compare this to that faster moving river, you'd be unable to see any sediment in it. Or if you are, it would be very slight. On to our next topic, lakes and ponds. What's the difference between rivers and streams and lakes and ponds? Lakes and ponds are non-flowing water. They can range from a few square meters to many square kilometers. And on the pond side of things, they generally last much less than lakes. They could be seasonal or they could be temporary. Lakes could exist for millennia. Now, the temperature varies depending upon the season, and there is a cycle that we are going to look deeper into in the next slide. The summer stratification, fall overturn, winter stratification, and spring overturn. What does this, all of this mean? Let's start from the summer. In the summer stratification, there is a great difference in temperature between the top and the bottom of the lake. And while there is wind causing the lake to move, the difference in temperature and such does not transfer all the way to the bottom. Which is why you'll have the bottom, let's say, pick up minerals and such, and the top will be able to have more oxygen and such. Now, as we move towards the fall, fall overturn happens. What is the fall overturn? The fall overturn is where the wind is rotating the energy. So the nutrients and the minerals in the bottom of the lake come to the surface, and then the oxygen comes to the bottom. So it, they exchange the materials they built up during summer. In the winter, there is a layer of ice that's going to form, and this is going to prevent the bottom of the lake of, from freezing. 
it will act as a sort of insulator, which is why lakes, lake dwelling species will not die during the winter because their water will not be frozen. And same stratification that may happen in summer happens in winter. And then the spring overturn, just like the fall overturn, ex- exchanges both minerals, minerals going from down to up, and oxygen going from up to down. Now, on to the types of lakes. We have two main types. Oligotrophic lakes and eugotrophic eug- lakes. My apologies. Now, oligotrophic lakes are found generally in higher altitudes, and they have very few plant and animal species in them, maybe none at all, because they have very few nutrients to support life. Let's say examples of them. As you can see, the water is very clear because there are no living beings in it. There is nothing to disturb the water. Now, eutrophic lakes, which are the nutrient-rich ones that support many species in them, are found generally at lower altitudes. As you can tell, they are nutrient-rich, and they have a lot of animals and plants. Now, lakes and ponds can be divided into three sections. We base them mostly off of the amount of sunlight that enters into the water. There is the section that's by the shore, the littoral zone. There is the limnetic zone, the section which is on the top and gets a lot of sunlight, but it is not connected to the shore. And then there is the profundal zone, the zone which is unable to get as much sunlight or even no sunlight at all. These are examples of the species you may find in the littoral zones here. Things such as amphibians, rooted and floating plants, grazing snails, algae, clams, insects, crustaceans, fishes, etc., etc. Now, some insects, which dwell most of their life on land, actually lay their eggs in the littoral zone. And they develop as larvas, which swim in water, and eventually they'll be able to leave the water and fly later on in their life. Now, other animals, such as turtle snakes and birds, might prey on the animals that inhibit the zone, fish or not. Now, what would you imagine would be the diversity level between the three zones? The littoral zones will support many, many species. So will the limnetic, because both of them are high up. They have a lot of sunlight. And then the profundal zone will more than likely only support bottom dwellers. Now, to be more specific, the littoral zone will have many species of freshwater organisms live in it because there is a lot of food, because both food from the shore and food from the water is there. Now, the limnetic zone is well lit, as you would imagine, as on being high up, and dominated by plankton. But what is plankton? Plankton is any small free-floating autotrophs, and in some cases heterotrophs, that live in freshwater or marine systems. But what do we mean by that? So things like algae, microorganisms, and such that are floating in the water can be considered plankton. Now, the profundal zone, which is the lower zone, is much colder. You would imagine it's deeper in the lake, has less oxygen because it has less sunlight, and has less species because there is less sunlight, once again. And it is, of course, the deepest area of the lake. On to transitional aquatic ecosystems. What do we mean by transitional aquatic ecosystems? We mean ecosystems where Fresh water and salt water meet each other, or water and land meet each other. Wetlands are examples, so are estuaries. Wetlands. What is a wetland? A wetland is not a biome itself, it is a bunch of different kinds of land. It's marshes, swamps, and bogs. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean that It's a place that is terrestrial, but it has so much water in it that it supports more aquatic species, per se, than land. That's why it's classified under aquatic systems. They have a great number of species diversity because they're able to support both 
species that live on land and species that live in water, uh, support things like fabians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Now, these are examples of wetlands, marshes, bogs, and swamps. And these are just some of the species you may see. Now, what you may see here is most of these plants, such as duckweed, cattail, and such, can live on water. At least can live with their roots submerged underwater. We may now move on to estuaries. Estuaries are where salt water and fresh water meet, generally at the mouth of a river. They are among the most diverse ecosystems only comparable to things like tropical rainforests and coral reefs. And you will see a lot of algae, seaweeds, and marsh grasses. Now, notice how you see things such as seaweeds, which live in saltwater system. That's because you have salt water mixing with fresh water. A lot of animal species here, which include worms, oysters, crabs, but are not limited to those live here. And those organisms eat detritus. Detritus is what you can consider a decomposing material. They're small pieces of organic material and they're not necessarily alive. That's why we cannot consider them as predators. Many marine species, while even if they don't live in an estuary, they will use it for things such as nursing, nesting, feeding, and even migration. Now, when we say migration, they, we mean they would take a rest a temporary rest out there, such as migratory birds would do. Salt marshes are transitional aquatic systems that are very similar to estuaries. And marine ecosystems, which means ecosystems that are in salt water or in the ocean, similarly to the freshwater ones, the ponds, lakes, oceans, are separated into zones. There is the intertidal zone, which is separated into a few zones itself. There is the high zone, which is the spay zone, doesn't get much water. The high tide zone, the one that would only really get water when there are very high tides, such as at a new moon, maybe. There is the mid tide zone, which is the one that experiences the most changes during the day because water is always rising and lowering in the mid tide. Then the low tide zone, which is when the tide is at its lowest and it can always be underwater. Now, the intertidal zone, while we saw what it's separated to, where is it exactly? Some of us may know it as beaches, and that would be an example of an intertidal zone. It's where it's this strip of land where the ocean is meeting, is meeting that strip of land. Now, what you would expect is a high level of erosion here until the point where it reaches sand, which is the smallest kind of particle possible, because the water is always going up and down with the tide. Therefore, it's eroding that ecosystem. And because this ecosystem is so ever-changing, you will see communities come and go very often, rather than having to go through the whole process of reform normally, and then you'd have succession and all of that. No, communities just come and go all the time without succession. Now, on to the open ocean zone. There are three main zones in the open ocean. There is an aquatic zone. There is the photic zone and the aquatic zone. The photic zone, as you could tell from its name, it is, it's a zone where it's shallow enough that there is light in it. We can, we can split it into diff, two different zones known as mesopelagic and epipelagic. There is the aphotic zone, where we, you can imagine from the name, there is no sunlight here, there is no light at all. Then there is the abyssal zone, which is not a zone per se, but it's part of the aphotic. It's the deepest part of it where the word abyss comes from. Then the necrotic zone is the zone where water meets the land.
Now on to coastal ocean and coral reef. The co coral reefs, as you may imagine, are going to be by the necrotic zone, and they are the most diverse system on Earth. They form protective barriers, you could say, along continents that protect shorelines from erosion, for the most part. They are sensitive to changes in their environment, whether caused by natural events or human impact, especially changes in the pH or temperature. Now, here are a few species here that you will find in coastal ecosystems. Algae, coral, coral reef, coral reef and algae, which is a symbiotic relationship and the only symbiotic relationship you need to know here. Thucenothelia. And that is the end of this lesson. Study well and good luck in the finals.